never heard a robust gospel come out of the mouth of Pastor Rick Warren. Is he a heretic? No. No. Go ahead and grill him on penal substitutionary atonement. He's there. Justification by faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone. Is he your cup of tea? Probably not. Is he a heretic? No. Whoa, cowboys. Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash, and a brotherly reply to Todd Friel. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. I'd like to reply to Todd Friel. Because I've prayed for his ministry in the past, I've actually supported it financially, not usually, but I'd send him a hundred bucks, things like that, because I appreciated so much of what he did in contending for the truth so often, things of which I agreed with him. I agreed with you, Todd, and I appreciated your stance, but I also put out a video clip some months ago appealing to yourself, J.D. Hall, Chris Rosbro, about your allegiances to John MacArthur in light of some of what he's teaching. You seem to treat him almost as an untouchable. It's essentially very similar to a blind Jesuit loyalty to the papacy or something of that nature. Like he's infallible, like he can do no wrong, like anyone taking issue has spoken against the Holy See. Well, my concern was John MacArthur's teaching, his teaching that it will be possible to worship the Antichrist, take the mark of the beast, in effect, sell one soul to Satan. Now, the question is, if you're living in the tribulation period and you take this mark, in other words, you identify with the beast's empire, will you still be able to be redeemed? And I think the answer to that is yes. Yes. Otherwise, there would be no salvation of anybody in the end of the tribulation. So I don't think the fact that someone takes that is a sentence to it to permanency. Worship the image of the beast and still be saved and be born again after the Holy Spirit is no longer even restraining evil, which John MacArthur himself rightly teaches. How he can do this and how people like you can defend him in light of what the word of God says, I do not know. I will read this again. We are told, and the smoke of their torment goes up and now tau and now in Greek forever and ever, literally from age to ages, translating the underlying Hebrew concept olame olamim. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast and his image. <clears throat> and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now, on what basis can your infallible John MacArthur say that people who do this will still be able to be born again and go to heaven in an environment where the Holy Spirit is no longer actively restraining evil or convicting people of sin in the sense of the age of grace. But let's continue. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who'd been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who would not worship the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. In the millennial reign of Jesus, those who take the mark will not be part of the resurrection of the righteous. How can John MacArthur teach such blatant error? He does it based on a presupposition, mistranslating, and misinterpreting Revelation chapter 7. But that's another issue that's related, but not the core issue. How can someone sell their soul to Satan, take the mark of the beast, after the Holy Spirit is no longer restraining evil, which Mr. MacArthur himself agrees to, and still be born again and go to heaven? This is a very serious false doctrine. Mr. MacArthur 
went on a rampage, even attacking old friends like Chuck Smith, anyone who was not a cessationist. He joined forces with the late R.C. Sproul, who practices infant baptism. This is extreme Calvinism, yet goes against anyone who's not a cessationist, trying to make cessationism the barometer of orthodoxy. Mr. MacArthur is a revisionist. He has a revisionist view of church history. He contended at that conference, of which you were a participant, that there is an order of orthodoxy that came from the apostles through some of the church fathers, particularly Augustine, then into the reformers, and then down to the present day, to people like himself who hold to that tradition. Well, let's understand the patristic authority, the church fathers, Augustine of Hippo. I've asked this before. Augustine of Hippo <clears throat> was a disciple of Ambrose of Milan, and he was influenced by Cyprian of Carthage, the sacramentalist, one of the primary founders of ritual Roman Catholicism. Augustine was a Platonist. He Platonized Christianity and rewrote it as a Platonic religion to accommodate Constantine's making Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, transforming Christianity into Christendom. Jesus said his kingdom is not of this world. Augustine then went on to invent the doctrine of the visible and invisible church by changing one verse, by changing one word in it. He actually changed one word in one verse and invented a false ecclesiology. In the parable of the wheat and tares, the field is the world, not the church. But Augustine said, the field is the church. It is made up of believers and non-believers. Therefore, we can sprinkle everybody. Let God decide who's really a believer or not. This infant baptism was never corrected by the reformers. Telling people they're Christians when they're not. Telling people that their children are Christians because of a ritual performed in infancy. This is one of the many areas the reformers failed to restore New Testament Christianity. And Augustine accommodated much of this. He facilitated it with the Platonization, with the false doctrine of the visible and invisible church, and then spiritualizing the millennial reign of Christ meaning the Roman Empire. In the year 1000 AD, Pope Sylvester said, well, the millennium is almost over, Christ will be back next year. So people gave their land, their possessions, their money, their castles to the church, because Jesus was coming back at the end of the millennium. No one got their money back. But this goes back to Augustine. I ask you, ask John MacArthur, where did the Lord Jesus or the apostles ever teach the church could use violence to convert people on the pretense that God knocked St. Paul off of a horse? Therefore, the church can use violence to convert people to be believers in Jesus. Jesus never taught this. The apostles never taught this. But Augustine did. Now, I do not deny that Augustine and others were right against the heretic Pelagius, who denied original sin, that is true. But this man was a Platonist. This man promulgated a proto-sacramentalism. He rewrote Christianity as the religion of the Roman state, imperial Rome. Constantine's interest was to use Christianity to hold his crumbling empire together between the Latin West and the Greek East. This was Augustine. Yet he's a kingpin in John MacArthur's ecclesiology and claims that there's a train of orthodoxy that comes through Augustine. Where did Jesus or the apostles teach these things, like the use of violence to convert people? Where did the apostles teach Platonic philosophy? Where? Then he gets to the reformers. 
They're supposed to have kept it, particularly Calvin. John Calvin had a theocratic police state, admired by the modern Iranian mullahs. The Saudi Mutawa admire John Calvin's police state, a theocratic police state, not only heretics like Severitus, but about 250 people were burned in the name of Jesus Christ in an oppressive regime. Where did Jesus ever teach this, what John Calvin did? John MacArthur is a Baptist. Do you know what would have happened to John MacArthur as a Baptist in Calvin's Geneva? He would have been arrested, maybe killed. Yet he foolishly trains that this is the line of biblical orthodoxy through the reformers. Let's look at reformed Protestantism. I live some of the time in Great Britain where the English Puritan Calvinists and Scottish Presbyterian Calvinists massacred each other in the name of Jesus Christ. Where did the apostles or Jesus ever teach we should murder other Christians in the name of Jesus? They killed each other. They killed other Calvinists. The cult de Kampf unleashed by the Puritans in England that extended into Salem, Massachusetts. You want to talk about crazy charismatics, lunatic French charismatics? Oh, they exist. And I agree with you about Michael Brown. I agree with you about the word faith money teachers. I agree with you about Bill Johnson. These people are mystics, Gnostics, and con artists. I agree with you. But find me a lunatic charismaniac, as you may know the theological term for them is neomontanists that they, they practice neomontanism find me one of them just one who say we should execute people on the basis of spectral evidence this happened in britain and in massachusetts oh i had a dream mary jones is a witch oh i had a dream also and she was a witch Mary Jones is arrested, put on trial for her life. In Britain, they'd cut a hole in the ice, tie her to a pole, and put her under the frozen ice. If she drowned, she was innocent. If she didn't, it proved she had witchcraft powers. Burn her, hang her. They capitally executed people in the name of Jesus Christ based on spectral evidence. Please find me a Pentecostal or a charismatic who is as crazy as Calvinists. And it's legacy of the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa. Or of the Southern Baptist and Southern Methodists supporting the institution of slavery in the United States. Or the rape of Ireland justifying the expropriation of Irish land because the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous and the Catholics are the wicked and we are the righteous. No, I do not believe in Catholicism. But to persecute Catholic people in the name of Jesus? This is what John MacArthur appeals to as the apostolic line and you defend him. And because I point these things out, which you offend, Phil Johnson cannot refute or deny. He won't debate me in front of a camera. Either will John MacArthur. They cannot deny these things or refute them. They instead say, you can ignore Jacob Prash. He's a theological pugilist. And because he's not a cessationist, Anything he says doesn't matter anyway. Jacob Prash, a cranky, similarly disputatious, all-purpose theological pugilist. This is no defense. This circumvents the issue. This is circumlocution at its ugliest and most hypocritical. A pugilist? If you visit our website, just visit our website. The largest section of our budget is for missions and evangelism. 
the largest percentage of that is taking care of impoverished children in the third world. Philippines, AIDS babies in Africa, children we rescue from the rubbish dumps in Philippines in the slums. We're opening a new orphanage for Dalit children in Andhra Pradesh in India. This is our work. We work with the underground church in two countries where the church is actively persecuted. You go to our website, you'll find Bible teaching of a proactive nature as well as reactive, and you'll find a lot of evangelism oriented towards reaching Jews, reaching Roman Catholics, reaching Muslims, reaching Mormons. Our concern is evangelism, missions, church planting, helping the underground church, taking care of poor children in the third world. That's what we mainly do. Yes, indeed, we will stand up on discernment issues. We will speak out against error. That is entirely scriptural. But it's the only thing your ministry does. It's the only thing you do. The only way to know what you are for is to know what you're against. That's your whole ministry. And you say, I am the theological pugilist? Discernment is no more than 10 or 15% of what I and our ministry Moriel even does. What's really happening is Phil Johnson is trying to block and protect John MacArthur from John MacArthur's own statements. You laud him. You want to talk about contention, about pugilism? That conference that he did denouncing all charismatics and Pentecostals, not just the ultra charismatics or extreme Pentecostals, all of them, was a shame and a disgrace. It presented a revisionist view of church history, demonstrably so. He rewrote church history and he put them all in the same category. Now look, there are moderate Calvinists who I have greatly respected Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Charles Spurgeon, William Carey. But these people were often in their own era at odds with extreme Calvinists. Certainly true of William Carey. I don't put all Calvinists in the same category. Why do you do this with Pentecostals and Charismatics when it's not justified? I can show you, but that doesn't seem to matter to you. No, it's not about discernment. It's about theocratic politics and protecting your Pope. You talk about him being the president of Master's Seminary, Master's University. You don't mention the fact that that institution is on academic probation concerning its credibility as an accredited institution. It's on probation. Doesn't seem to be doing very well. But let's continue. John MacArthur has a view of the gospel that is framed by the Reformation. Sola Scriptura, Sola Gratia, Sola Fide, then sola Christus and obviously sola gloria Dei. These are things I would absolutely affirm. All of them are true. All of them were a fitting 16th century reaction to the heresy and false gospel of Roman Catholicism. I agree with sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia. But the Reformation definition of the gospel is correct in what it states. It fails in what it does not state. Mr. MacArthur is doctrinally confused. He equates the blood of Jesus and the death of Jesus as the same. He stated it on YouTube. In an interview, he teaches it. He does not understand the difference 
between the Paschal and the Kaporic aspects of the atonement and of salvation. He does not understand how Jesus was fulfilling Passover and partially fulfilling Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. He does not draw a distinction between the bread and the wine, the body and the blood. He equates them the way Roman Catholics do when they take the Eucharistic Lord's Supper with only one emblem instead of two. Only to them, of course, it's not emblematic. They believe it's transubstantiated. No, no. It's the body and the blood. He fulfills both Pesach, Passover, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. There's the body and the blood. Mr. MacArthur does not understand the difference between the two. He's right what he says. But what he says comes from the Reformation efforts to defend the truth against Roman Catholicism. It does not come directly from an apostolic understanding of the crucifixion of Jesus. He, he's not what you think he is. But for him to go on teaching that you can take the mark of the beast, this is the issue that you people are afraid to debate. Is it what you believe, Todd Friel? Then it goes on. Concerning this religious broadcasters conference, if it were indeed a mere trade fair where you had experts from a legal background in communications law updating religious broadcasters about changes in the law or about changes in Federal Communications Commission regulations or about IRS regulations concerning fundraising and donor relations. If it was just a trade fair, as it were, that would be one thing. If it was just a trade fair, making participants in the conference aware of new technologies for broadcasting, I'd have no problem with John MacArthur attending along with Rick Warren. I wouldn't care if he attended it with Bugs Bunny. It's just a trade fair. But when the theme of that event at which he's going to speak is called Advancing Biblical Truth with the participation of Rick Warren, now we have a problem. We can, in one case, make a distinction and must between guilt by cooperation and guilt by association. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us when we make that distinction. It says this. This is what the word of God instructs us. This is what Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us. In verse 9 of chapter 5 in 1 Corinthians, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with the moral people. I did not mean at all with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or idolaters. Then you'd have to go out of the world. I'm in ministry full time, but I have a secular business part time. Sometimes I have to deal with unsaved people. I tried to witness to them. I tried to be a witness to them by conducting my business affairs ethically, but I won't be partnered with them. I won't be unequally yoked but I still have to work with unsaved people. Most Christians have to work with unsaved people to whom we have a witness and a testimony. When I lived in my native New York, I used to go out with my friends giving out tracts in Times Square. We would talk to drug dealers, to pimps, to prostitutes, to anybody. Homeless people of every description, criminals, whatever. There's no guilt by association in dealing with unsaved people to whom we have the message of salvation. That's wrong. But let's look here. What does he say next? Verse 11, but actually I wrote to you 
not to associate with any so-called brother if he's an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler, etc. Not even to associate with someone claiming to be a Christian who does those things. Not even to eat with such a one, which of course in the greater context of the epistle chapter 11 and so forth, means don't be a communicant with them. Don't take the Lord's Supper with them. Don't associate with these people. So-called brothers, swindlers, immoral people, con artists. I had it out eyeball to eyeball once in Hawaii with Benny Hinn. I told him he was a false prophet and I can prove it. I don't consider him to be a brother. He's a false brother. I've had other similar encounters with such people. As I think you probably have. Michael Brown is no friend of mine, I assure you. I opposed him over Pensacola, over his false prophecies, and now his involvement with Bill Johnson. We're not to be associated with those people. But you defend Rick Warren, and you defend John MacArthur's association with him. This kind of association is de facto cooperation. Advancing biblical truth, it's not just a trade fair. If it was a trade fair, I couldn't care less. Where every ministry puts up its own display table, where manufacturers of new technologies merchandise their wares at a trade show like they have them in Las Vegas and Chicago and so forth. I'd have no problem with that. No problem. If you were listening to Christian lawyers telling you about how not to get in trouble with what you say about same-sex marriage or abortion and things of this nature, I'd have no problem. By all means, go to it if you need to do that for your broadcasting ministry. It's a trade fair. But when you say its purpose is advancing biblical truth, what does Rick Warren have to do with biblical truth? Can you tell me what a man who first opposes same-sex marriage in California and supports Proposition 8 and then in the public media denies having done it, openly lying, demonstrably lying, holding hands with Elton John in front of the U.S. Congress saying, if I kissed you, it would be the kiss heard around the world. Elton John, a homosexual activist, lives near where I used to live when I was in seminary in Britain. This is Rick Warren. The very ecumenical Rick Warren who says the Church of Rome must be at the table of Christian unity. If an angel of God comes with another gospel, he's accursed, anathema, writes St. Paul. Does the blood of Christ cleanse from all sin, Todd, or do we atone for our own in purgatory? Are we saved by second birth or by an ex opere operato sacramental ritual performed by a Roman priest who may be a pedophile or something? Is it sola fide, sola gratia, sola Christus, or sola sacramentum? Which gospel? But we need Catholics at the table. Now, my own family is a mixture of Roman Catholic and Jewish backgrounds. I went to a Roman Catholic school, and I went to a Jewish community center. I tell people the joke, but it's true. I was both sprinkled and clipped. I can read Latin, and I can speak fluent Hebrew. I know both. And the same as I tell people that Talmudic Judaism is a false Judaism that denies its own Messiah, Roman Catholicism is a false Christianity with a different gospel that is saturated with idolatry and superstition and necromancy, to say nothing of the moral corruption of that institution against which the reformers 
themselves Roman Catholic priests correctly reacted. But now Rick Warren is saying it's got to be at the table. Get a copy of a Roman Catholic catechism with an imprimatur or nylon opstat. They've not changed their doctrines one bit. Not indulgences, not sacramentalism, not any of it. This is your Rick Warren, who you want at the table. I have never heard a robust gospel come out of the mouth of Pastor Rick Warren. Is he a heretic? No. No. Go ahead and grill him on penal substitutionary atonement. He's there. Justification by faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone. Is he your cup of tea? Probably not. Is he a heretic? No. Woe, cowboys. No. If someone defends another gospel, they are a heretic. I can say much more, but I'll say one more thing. You think about this. I have pointed this out before, but it didn't seem to register. The Apostle Paul said, other gods are demons, demonoi in Greek. Moses said, other gods are demons, shedim in Hebrew. Other gods are demons. I was just in India a few weeks ago. We're opening an orphanage there. I saw people drinking cow urine because they thought it was holy water. Their gods are demons. I saw that religion. Hungry children, but cows being fed sacks of wheat. I've been to India more than once. I see what happens when people worship other gods. I lived in the Middle East for years. I've been from one end of the Muslim world to the other. I've been to Saudi Arabia, I've been to Morocco, I've been to Brunei, I've been to Malaysia, I've been to Indonesia, I've been to Jordan, Egypt. I've been to the Persian Gulf, I've been to Turkey. I've been from one end of two to the other. I cannot find a single Islamic country that'll give Christians and Jews the rights they get in the United States or Great Britain or Australia New Zealand, Canada, or any other Western country. Not even one! Other gods. Well, Rick Warren teaches in his Global Peace Plan that we must partner with the worshipers of other gods to bring in worldwide peace. We must partner with Hindus who worship Brahma, who worship Shiva, who worship Krishna, who worship cows. We must partner with Islam, Allah being the name of the ancient Nabataean moon god, proven and provable with archaeology. We must unite with Mormons, with Roman Catholics. You know very well that the Eucharistic Christ of Rome is not the real Jesus. They worship bread and wine and pray to it as Christ incarnate physically, calling it the blessed sacrament. No, no. I am the Lord your God, Ani Elohecha. You will have no other gods before me. None! Read Corinthians. Read the Pentateuch. But Rick Warren says we have to partner with the worshipers of other gods to bring in global peace. We have to partner with worshipers of demons in order to have a world transforming agenda to bring in peace. This is what the Antichrist and false prophet will do a counterfeit peace by bringing the world's false religious system into league with its corrupt political economic system. This is the agenda of the Antichrist. And you say he's not a heretic? A man who says to 
partner with people who worship demons and other gods and you dare dare tell the body of Christ he's not a heretic? Either you are an ignoramus or you are a liar, Todd Friel. I'm not judging which of the two you are, but for your own sake, I pray to God you're an ignoramus because if you're not, you're a liar from hell. An apologist for antichrist deception. The arch promoter in the American Midwest of Rick Warren has been John Piper, who led the Lectio Divina with Beth Moore and other hyper charismatics, another bosom comrade of your Pope, your beloved John MacArthur. That's what you're trying to protect. And because somebody points it out, that means they're a theocratic or a theological pugilist. Our ministry is not a discernment ministry. We're about missions and evangelism, church planting. We're about exposition of scripture. We're about helping the persecuted church, taking care of sick kids in the third world, orphans. Yes, we are discerning and we do discernment, but it's not what we're about. Your entire raison d'etre is about discernment. And you call me a pugilist? No, no, no. You're not an apologist for truth. In defending Rick Warren and saying he's not a heretic, you've become an apologist for deception. You've become an apologist for error. Chris Ross bro has run away. J.D. Hall has run away. Phil Johnson has run away. And you can run away too. Run away from the truth. Run away from debating me about these issues. Go ahead, run. But you cannot run from Jesus Christ. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless.